You're listening to episode 57 of Paz de Chipotle. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food history writer, cook, and author. And on this podcast, I explore the gastronomic traditions of Mexico and bring together the voices of cooks, authors, and entrepreneurs who build cross-cultural bridges around the world, championing Mexican food. To find more information about the podcast and to subscribe to my newsletter, check this episode's notes or go to pasdechipotle.com. You can rate and leave a review for the show using your favorite podcast app. May is a very special month for the city of Puebla, Mexico, because we commemorate the victory of General Zaragoza and his troops over one of the world's greatest armies of its time that were the forces of Napoleon III. And there was a specifically significant battle that took place on the eventful day of May 5th, 1862. But in order to talk about this day properly and the way it's been signified and experienced over the centuries, well, that requires to explore a big range of topics that go from military history, geopolitics, international relations and a general spoonful of cultural studies. Of course, as you know, this is a podcast about gastronomy and cultural traditions around food in Mexico. But you know what? I really think we can indulge in adding a little twist and do one episode that is slightly different. Why? Well, because Cinco de Mayo has become, in the last 20 years or so, pretty much a mainstream celebration in the US. And as of late, it has even expanded further afield. I think many of you have heard of people being slightly confused at what is the exact meaning of this celebration. Is it... Mexican Independence Day? Is it the anniversary of the revolution? Why is it so big in the US to the point of becoming an excuse to get drunk and eat loads of Tex-Mex food? Well, if you are familiar with the show, you know that I never shy away from taking a deep dive in history to find out the origin of traditions and the way they've changed over time. And I can guarantee that this episode won't disappoint at providing as much context as I think it will be useful to fully explore Cinco de Mayo. So this episode will work like this. At the center of the story will be the actual event of the battle. But in order to understand why it occurred, I will attempt to explain how Napoleon III, then Emperor of France, the great reformer of Mexico, President Benito Juárez, young general Ignacio Zaragoza, and a Habsburg prince ended up entangled in a story of intrigue, treason, greed, death, and glory. Now, in preparation of this episode, I revisited a few books, some in Spanish and some in English, and because over the years I've received so many comments and questions on Twitter and Instagram and my footers about Cinco de Mayo, well, I have left a bunch of links with extra content for you on a special blog post at pasdechipotle.com. So you can click the link on the episode description to have a deep read. Okay, okay, I'll wrap it up here. And I will let the story of Cinco de Mayo begin. I hope you enjoy this episode. Part 1. The Birth of a Nation From the early years of the 1800s, it will become clear that this century was going to be complicated and full of life-changing events on this side of the world. It all started when New Spain, later Mexico, was still a Spanish colony, but joined the independentist movement that sent shockwaves throughout Latin America, culminating in the actual war of independence that polarized society between aspiring republicans and royalists who didn't want to give up their privileges and would rather remain under Spain's control. But as is often the case in history, with their support or not independence, 
was achieved on September 15 in 1810 and with it a new free nation under the name of Mexican Empire was born. Agustín Cosme Damián de Iturbide y Aramburu was a high-ranking militar that campaigned with the Royalist Army, leading many battles, hunting down liberal caudillos during the War of Independence. But eventually, it will become clear that the population overwhelmingly supported independence. So he signed the document of Plan de Iguala in 1821 that proclaimed the independence of Mexico from Spain. A provisional government was created and Iturbide was appointed by the Congress as acting head of this government. However, Agustin soon realized that he could still leverage much of the discontent and the resentment from the royalists who railed to his support and in a shocking turn of events, he decided to suppress the Mexican Congress and Iturbide temporary was appointed by his new group of supporters, Emperor Agustin I, and he was crowned in 1822 with a promise that he would remain in power until a suitable emperor was appointed. Again, his open ambition made it clear that he had no intention to give up his new title and position. But having no real political experience, he polarized even more the already volatile political environment and his imperial dreams came down to an abrupt end when he lost the support of his allies and abdicated in March 1823. After Congress was reinstituted, Iturbide was named public enemy of the state and anyone who gave support to him or his cause will be declared a traitor. Iturbide fled Mexico and his brief exile took place in Italy, where, you may wonder, Well, at one of the many properties of Marie-Pauline Bonaparte in Liorna. Pauline was sister of Napoleon Bonaparte and aunt of Louis Napoleon, later Napoleon III. Although there is very little known about the relationship of these two, their connection with the Bonapartes will turn out to be particularly significant in future decades which is why I decided to start the introduction here. Conspiracy and political drama were never far from Iturbide, and after moving from Italy to England, he then sailed back to Mexico, breaking the terms of his exile because, quote-unquote, he wanted to warn the interim president of a royalist plot to bring down his government. But upon his arrival in Mexico, he was apprehended and executed in the town of Padilla in the northern state of Tamaulipas on July 19, 1824. His execution was exemplary and unheard of. The message was clear. Mexico was far from having its future figure out, but was not going to tolerate another empire. Sadly, not everyone got this memo. After this huge event, in the following 32 years, Mexico went on to have a tumultuous succession of 26 presidents, some of them lasting less than a year. But at the end of those 32 years, we arrive at the presidency of Benito Juárez. Part 2. France <laughs> Charles-Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, later known just as Napoleon III, was the son of Louis Bonaparte, who was the brother of V. Napoleon. Napoleon III was born on April 20, 1808, and grew in the shadow of the fame and ambition of the Bonaparte men. At the age of 28, in 1836, he launched and failed at organizing a coup d'état to seize the power in France. He tried again in 1848 when he was 32 years old, and after embarrassing himself and his supporters, he fled to Britain, where he remained until the death of the last French king, Louis-Philippe I, giving way to the Second French Republic. Louis-Napoleon 
ensured the support of conservatives to appoint him as the presidential candidate and actually won and with a huge majority in 1848. But being a man of ambition, when he realized that he could not longer secure his re-election, on December 2, 1851, he launched again a coup d'etat, assuming total control and cancelling parliament's power. And he put an end to the Second Republic, and by 1852, he became Napoleon III, Emperor of France. Napoleon wanted to modernize France, invest in industry and build a new and thriving empire. And to do so, he charmed the British by supporting them on the Crimean War in 1853. But by doing this, he heightened the tensions between the Tsar Nicholas I and the Ottoman Empire and ultimately ended up facilitating the Russian expansion, something that no one really wanted. This was just a move to prove himself and France as a diplomatic force at a moment when no European nation was looking forward to joining any other war. But that's a tale for another podcast. Let's just say that the Crimean War was an utter mess, and by the time it ended in 1856, Britain, Turkey, Sardinia and Austria had very little diplomatic relationships with Russia. And France simply took this chance to do some chest pounding and showing off the shape and size of its army. So, well done, Napoleon. And this is when things begin to get complicated. By the end of the 1850s, it was clear that Mexico, on the other side of the world, was in deep political trouble. The government of Benito Juárez was dealing with enormous political pressure to keep up with the payments of the foreign debt, which it was clear that at that point wasn't going to be an easy way out. But why was Mexico in such financial ruin? Well... The persisting internal political clashes between conservative royalists and liberals was bleeding money, and the nation was severely crippled after the disastrous aftermath of the American invasion of Mexico and the many attacks that took place between 1846 and 1847 that culminated with an even worse outcome with the secession of Nevada, Utah, part of New Mexico, California, Arizona, parts of Colorado and Wyoming to the US. On top of that, the perfect storm was just brewing as Mexico's main creditors were growing impatient and wanted reassurance that the ever-so-growing debt would be repaid. And these creditors were Britain, Spain and yes, you guessed it, France. I will examine in detail the parallel situation in Mexico at this time in history further on. But let's just lay out this key series of events. Napoleon III tried to convince Britain and Spain to join France in a military campaign against Mexico in order to forcibly claim the payment of the debt. But Britain and Spain refused to engage and called Mexico to renegotiate the payments and the new terms were successfully agreed in a treaty that was signed by Mexico, Britain and Spain in London on the 31 of October 1861. Napoleon refused to let go of this opportunity to pursue his expansionist ambitions and decided that the Mexican debt to France was excuse enough to invade Mexico, depose President Juárez and create a Latin empire in the West. But in order to achieve all that in the future, he will need the support of Mexican royalists and the participation of some minor European royalty to play the part of his political puppets as heads of this empire. Part 3. Benito Juárez The whole figure of Benito Juárez has been quite idealized as part of the mysticism of Mexico's transition into a functioning liberal republic, with laws and institutions. His personal history is nothing short of the perfect dramatic twists of a political hero. 
He was born into a poor indigenous family in the mountains of Gelatao in Oaxaca. And at the young age of just three, he became an orphan. A few years later, but still a child, he fled to the city of Oaxaca without even being fully fluent in Spanish. He entered a monastery as a foundling, where he received an education, and some years down the road, he was well on his way of becoming a priest. When he had a change of heart and opted out for law, a choice that would prove fundamental for the fate of a whole nation. Juarez broke many stereotypes by becoming the first council member of pure indigenous origin. His political career led him to several positions as a public servant and member of the judicial court in his home state of Oaxaca. What is rapidly escalated and made strong allies with radical liberals, the scientific community, and became a prominent member of the Freemasons. He was heavily involved in promoting amendments to the law to inch out the church from the political life. These actions didn't sit well with the conservative state of Oaxaca, as you can imagine, but it was highly praised by many liberal intellectuals and politicians across the country. And for that, he was appointed as Attorney General of the state of Oaxaca and soon after became governor of his state. Fast forward some years and tumultuous events and another unprecedented move came. He was named as head of the Supreme Court of Mexico. The social and political life in the country were far from being a smooth path to becoming a true democracy. The ideological clashes led to numerous armed confrontations, uprisings and betrayals. What it was clear is that if Mexico was to become a modern country, it really needed to break free from the shackles of the colonial past, and that meant dismantling the power of the church. After stepping up for a brief period as interim president between 1857 and 61, due to the escalation of political conflicts, he launched immediately an ambitious reform plan that became known as the Reform War. Because conflict around this escalated so rapidly that it really became a civil war that lasted for two years between 1858 and 1860. Now, if you're familiar with Mexican history, I know you may have heard mentions of the War of Reform. But which were these reforms exactly and why were they so important? Well, I made a little list to highlight some of the big goals that these reforms had. The two key institutions that were going to be the target of these reforms were the army and the Catholic Church. And the main goals of the reform included restricting army and clerical privileges, the subordination of the church to the civil law, confiscation of clerical lands and properties, abolish nunneries and monasteries, making education free and secular, crafting a law to protect freedom of press, making civil marriages and not religious ceremonies the only legal valid union abolish religious celebrations as bank holidays, make religious freedom a right, and the secularization of schools, hospitals, and charitable institutions. Now, by any standard, the reform laws were incredibly visionary and groundbreaking, and they became an important precedent for many Latin American countries that tried to emulate them. The old ruling class and the allies of the church didn't step back without a fight. They felt deeply aggravated and personally offended in every possible way. And this unrest, anger and thirst for revenge were at the core of the backlash that came after. Well, the impact and relevance of this liberal triumph became a defining historical moment for Mexico. The challenges were incredibly complex when these events were unfolding. The civil war and constant uprisings added up to the already precarious national economy, meaning 
the country was in tatters, and Juarez was not only forced to pay for all the broken dishes, he also had to deal with a ticking time bomb that was the mounting international debt acquired by, again, previous conservative administrations, and faced the onerous task to basically, as I mentioned earlier, renegotiate that debt to secure an agreement to repay the interest to Britain and Spain, while France categorically refused to accept the terms. And that is why Napoleon III sent his fleas and troops to invade Mexico in 1861. The French invasion was anything but a sudden decision. Napoleon had plotted this for a long time, forging secret alliances and sweet-talking the resentful Mexican conservatives to join his efforts to depose Juarez and reinstall a quote-unquote truly European regime that would restore their privileges. Part 4. The Battle So now we arrive at the actual historical moment of the French invasion, which ended with the humiliating loss of the French army on the eventful day of May 5th, 1862. Before I start describing the events of the battle, I just want to say that in the collective memory of the state of Puebla, the triumph of this battle is deeply significant for many reasons, all of which will become clear as I talk you through the way these events unfolded. And while this historical episode had repercussions for all the nation, the remembrance of it is only really honored in the state of Puebla and the city of Puebla. Everywhere else in Mexico is only but a historical date on the calendar and is not even marked as a bank holiday. Now, going back to 1862. For Mexico, the exaggerated escalation of France's threats sent all sorts of red flags, as it was clear that diplomatic negotiations would not offer any solution, and that Mexico had to defend itself at all costs from yet another international threat, with potentially devastating results. So on April of that year, around 6,000 members of Napoleon's troops, led by General Charles Ferdinand Latry Comte Lorences, who had previously fought during the Crimean War, reached the port of Veracruz. And from there, they fought their way following the trade routes through mountains and valleys that would lead them to Puebla. Meanwhile, Benito Juárez's government appointed Ignacio Zaragoza, a young but very experienced general of only 33 years old, to lead the defense with a Tunisian army of 2,000 men. The first armed clashes took place in Veracruz, and as the French troops inched towards Puebla, Zaragoza's familiarity with the rugged landscape played at their advantage, at slowing down the advancement and leading the French troops to areas where they could be attacked. About two kilometers northeast of the center of Puebla, the forts of Loreto and Guadalupe were the city's more strategic defense points, located on top of the Acuayametepec hills. Zaragoza and his fellow generals and lieutenants, Porfirio and Félix Díaz, González Ortega and Berrio Zaval, among others, counted on maximizing these strategic locations. Now, at the face of the volatile episodes during the colonial period, a series of special tunnels were built in order to connect key religious and political buildings to secret escape routes that were meant to be used in the event of a violent conflict. Many of these tunnels were not only fully functional in the 19th century, they were further conditioned to store food supplies, ammunition, to serve as shelter for civilians, and were even wide and high enough to allow the cavalry to ride towards the forts from the center and outskirts of the city and vice versa. On May 4th, the Republican army received the distressing but unsurprising news that Mexican and Poblano royalists had dispatched their troops to join the French. This forced Zaragoza to prepare a quick counterattack and sent messages to the north of the Sierra Mountains of Puebla to plead the towns of Zacapuaxla, Xochiapulco and Tela del Rio to join in the defense of Puebla. 
To Sarah Wilson's advantage was the fact that Lawrence's arrogance had resulted in a very delayed reaction to the fact that he had overconfidently marched with his troops into a trap. However, this wasn't going to be an easy battle, because the Mexican side was grossly outnumbered, less equipped and spread out too thinly. At the most critical moment for Zaragoza's army came the news that the godsend last hope of around 2,700 indigenous farmers were storming the hills with their work tools and machetes and rained down fiercely upon the surprised French soldiers, causing chaos and confusion, which gave them enough time for the cavalry and artillery to regroup and lead the last attack upon Lorenz's army, forcing him to retreat back to Veracruz. Right in the heat of the battle, many French soldiers got lost and probably many others took the chance to desert their own troops and run away. And to this day there are persistent stories of these blue-eyed white soldiers that fled into the mountains and never returned to Europe. The victory of Zaragoza and his small but fierce and well-organized Republican army against the forces of the world's most prestigious army became instantly emblematic as the event galvanized the nationalist spirit among all the classes and ethnicities of the bruised and battered young republic its idealistic president and valiant army had succeeded, and it became the perfect metaphor for the triumph of the underdogs whose honor and loyalty overcame greed and arrogance. Well, you might think that with this humiliating defeat, Napoleon would have abandoned his expansionist ambition, but actually it became the perfect excuse to take even more radical actions as he had already set in motion a more complex plan to bring down Mexico and Juarez's presidency from within. Zaragoza had mixed feelings about the whole outcome of the battle, because while it proved the stature of his men and his own leadership, it also made painfully evident that the underground royalist groups were more dangerous than previously thought, and they were quick to sell their allegiance to the highest bidder, and this proved to be just but a taste of what was to come. But sadly, Young Zaragoza wouldn't be around to fight again, as he died of typhoid only four months later. And the following year became Puebla's most devastating and dark episode that left a trail of death, destruction and betrayal. But before we dive in, let's take a little break and I will get some water. <music> More than three years ago, when I decided to start Past Chipotle podcast, I wanted it to be the audible companion and extension of my own independent editorial project with themed books that contained carefully researched recipes to prepare traditional dishes presented alongside the equally tantalizing and rich cultural history behind them. And with much craft and passion, I also worked in the photography and editorial design of each of my books, which are Mexican fiestas, Mexican street food, Mexican chocolate, Puebla's great food tour, and my latest Mexican market food. As a digital author, I get to have the enormous privilege of creative freedom, and I use it to produce these books to take you on a journey, discovering the amazing history behind the wonderful world of Mexican food. If you want to know more about my books and start the making of your own traditions, go to pasachipotle.com forward slash publications or click the link on this episode's notes. Go to pasachipotle.com forward slash publications and get ready to cook, learn and enjoy Mexican food like you never imagined. You might be wondering at this point, why did Puebla become the ground zero of an international plot to set an European empire in the Americas? So, to answer this, let me review some aspects that might explain it. Throughout the 289 years that lasted the colonial period, the province of Puebla was the most influential territory, as its old geographical extension reached from coast to coast, 
and had the exclusive control of the trade of staple and sumptuary, that is, luxurious, products that came from all of Europe and the Far East, Africa and South America, that came into New Spain via the merchant ports of the Pacific and the Gulf of Mexico. Puebla was not only a beacon of trade, industry and politics, but was also a Spanish city, built with the sole purpose of becoming a beacon of education and spirituality, where even the architectural and urban design were meant to inspire and model colonial cities across the Spanish colonies of the Americas. Prior to the independence of New Spain, it became clear for Puebla that it could not withhold its economic gravitas without the crucial mining industry that it lacked and other provinces excelled at, but still managed to sustain its influence as the agricultural powerhouse of Mexico and it remained the entry point from Europe and was a sort of diplomatic capital that always rivaled with Mexico City. On the other hand, the very noble city of the Angels, as the foundational charter pompously declared, was still home of the most conservative and royalist ranks of Mexico, which, as I mentioned before the break, they were pretty much ready to answer any call that promised the poblano aristocracy a return of the old regime. Part 5. The Siege of Puebla So we left things at the victory of Juárez and Zaragoza on May 5th, 1862. And after Zaragoza's sudden death, the Zacatecas-born González Ortega, assistant general, was appointed as his successor. And ten months later, it started the siege of Puebla that lasted 62 days of constant attacks by the French army, beginning on March 16 and ending on May 17th, 1863. Now this time Puebla was prepared with 24,828 troop members, which included battalions from different states, but thousands of them were volunteers who had no experience or proper military training. And that will prove to be Mexico's main weakness at this point. Seven more forts were equipped to protect the city, along with the old forts of Loreto and Guadalupe. This time, Napoleon III had sent the well-experienced General Elie Frédéric Forey, who arrived in Veracruz the previous September with 28,226 soldiers. These soldiers came with 5,584 horses and 549 mules, and a small but significant army of Mexican royalists joined them, and they were around 2,000 and 500. The initial strategy to arrive in Mexico City, as proposed by the French ambassador Dubois de Saligny, was to simply surround Puebla. But for the French army, it had become a question of honor to avenge their past defeat in the same battleground. Now, I'm going to give you the condensed version of the siege, otherwise we will be here until Christmas. So here I go. There were key strategies that the French used to first use the Mexican royalists to cut off all access routes to starve the city and prevent any battalion to come in or out. They surrounded the nine forts and built trenches around the center of the city and they carried sustained attacks to attempt to destroy the old Jesuit colleges and other buildings that were used as forts. The operation turned to be painfully slow, with very little success to actually destroy these buildings. But as weeks grew longer, Puebla rapidly began to run out of food and the Republican army of ammunition, and only the old tunnels kept a slow but essential supply to sustain them. In spite of the desperate efforts of General González Ortega and his commanders, without the essential arrival of reinforcements, rendition seemed the only way to save the city from further destruction and death. General Thore sent documents laying out the terms of the rendition to be signed by General Ortega, but him and the other high-ranking members of the army refused to sign it, and they in exchange offered their promise to honor their rendition with their word, which only infuriated Thore, who ordered their capture and that they were sent to France to be kept as war prisoners. 
The trail of chaos and destruction of Puebla was only but the beginning of what was to come. The French army rapidly marched to Mexico City to occupy the capital and capture Juarez, who decided to collect as many key official documents as he could and fled from the capital, starting a period that became known as the Itinerant Republic that lasted from May 1863 to July 1867. The Doomed Hasburg Empire Since we've been following the unraveling of all of these events with so much detail, it will be just unfair and rude if I don't take you for a full ride to the culmination of the actual plan of Napoleon III. And I have to warn you, it has more endings than the Lord of Rings, but I will try to compress it all in a nutshell. A very big nutshell. Now, while Cinco de Mayo was and is a relevant event, let's not forget that he really intended to create an empire under his control. And this is the cue for the last of our unfortunate characters to arrive, Ferdinand Maximilian Joseph Maria von Habsburg Lothingen, Archduke of Austria and younger brother of his imperial and royal apostolic majesty, Emperor of Austria, King of Hungary, Franz Joseph Karl. Maximilian was born in 1832 into the house of Hasburg, and much to his bad luck, well, like all royal children who are not the firstborns, they are destined to a glamorous but tedious and, honestly, utterly useless lives. Maximilian had a vivacious and curious mind, and he was allowed to indulge in all his interests, like arts, literature, music, exploration, science, and liberal ideologies. Knowing that he will never succeed his brother, there was no harm in letting him enjoy this privileged life. After joining the Austrian navy, he found a new pleasure in traveling and learning about cultures, and even learned to speak several languages. As a true Hasburg in 1857, following the family tradition, Maximilian married Charlotte of Belgium, daughter of Leopold I of Belgium. They were 25 and 17 years old. As it was customary at the time, European nations used to outsource their monarchs from the big royal pool to ensure political and family alliances, and Maximilian, now a married young royal, received many offers at the beginning of the 1860s to be the head of different countries, including Poland and Greece. But he would choose to follow the advice of Napoleon III, who had been grooming the couple for years while he was skimming his ambitious plans. Knowing well that he would never succeed his brother as head of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the idea of becoming Emperor of Mexico seemed all the more seducing. And to speed things up, Napoleon III arranged a visit of a Mexican delegation of conservatives who went to charm Maximilian into accepting the invitation, arguing that it was the will and hope of people to have him as a monarch, which of course wasn't true. Charlotte, who never shied away from her ambitions, eagerly sailed with Maximilian to Mexico in 1864, only a few months after the fall of Puebla. They reached the port of Veracruz on May 29, 1864, and made their way to Puebla. Puebla the brave, Puebla the broken, and the land of many closeted royalists who worked earnestly preparing the city for such occasion. After spending a few days, they made their way to Mexico City to set at their small but lavish castle that will become the official residence of the couple, overviewing the city from the hills of Chapultepec. The short Hasburg reign was full of horrifying and strange surprises for everyone. Much to the royalists' dismay, they realized that Maximilian was far more liberal and progressive than they envisioned. 
he actually pushed for the continuation of many of Juarez's reforms, especially those regarding education and transitioning to a representative political system. Maximilian showed huge interest in Mexico's culture, even adopting the traditional charro dressing, as the landed gentry of Mexico used to wear, and shocked everyone by riding his own horse from the palace to the cathedral to attend mass. Charlotte, on the other hand, was very vocal about the disgust and disapproval of the limited and provincial education of her ladies-in-waiting, who spoke no European languages and had no political or intellectual opinions of their own. Maximilian really became an admirer of Juarez's vision, policies and personal history, but not so much as to abdicate. Instead, he offered Juarez amnesty if he vowed to swear allegiance to his empire, which of course was instantly rejected by Juarez. Two years into the empire, Napoleon decided that it was safe enough to order the return of the French troops in 1866. Meanwhile, once the American Civil War had ended and the diplomatic relationships between Mexico and the U.S. had healed, there was a real interest in supporting Juarez's presidency, which raised concerns for Maximilian as his nervous Mexican supporters became uncomfortable with this prospect and they feared that the empire was going to run to a halt. After a short armed confrontation between Juarez's Republican army and Maximilian's troops, the concerned emperor, desperate and afraid, tried to flee the country, only to be captured soon after. Juarez had also come to admire many of the liberal ideas of Maximilian, but regrettable as it was, he had been a puppet of France and the royalists, and he still had to face the consequences for being a foreign usurper of an established government. After a brief trial, to which Maximilian actually did not attend, as he claimed to be very poor in health, he was found guilty and sentenced to death by shooting. After Maximilian and his generals were executed in June 19, 1867, his body, well, was subject to a gruesome ordeal, much to the Hasberg humiliation. After a botched embalming, his corpse was rapidly decomposing, and it was clear that it would not make it in the best conditions back into Europe. Locks of his beard were sold, and his blue eyes were replaced for brown prosthetics. And if you're morbidly curious to find some more details about it, you can actually find a lot. You just have to Google Maximilian I corpse and you will see it for yourself. It's like the worst case of failed toxidermy. Anyway, after the carriage that transported Maximilian's body suffered from an accident and flipped over in a stream, Juarez ordered a second embalming before sending him to Vienna, where he was buried in the imperial crypt at the Capuchin Church in Vienna in January 1868. So, what happened to his widow, young Charlotte? Was she returned to Europe before his execution in 1866 to try to convince their former allies to help them, but her efforts were in vain. It is said that she suffered greatly and had episodes of hysteria and depression and remained in the care of her family for the rest of her life. And it was a long life because she died at the age of 86 years of pneumonia in 1927. Part 7. Legacy. Now, before we close the chapter that brought together Juarez, the indigenous Oaxacan boy who went on to become a president, the ambitious and colors Napoleon III and the liberal Hasbrook prince who went on to find fame and death as emperor of Mexico, I want to tell you a little bit about the cultural and gastronomic legacy that the very, very short Hasbrook empire left in Mexico. Along with the young couple came the Hungarian head chef Joseph Tudos, who was in charge of a little army of cooks at the imperial kitchens in Chapultepec. They produced releves, oysters, braised filets, souffle, sponges, ices, buttery croissants, lady fingers, and fancy fondants by the dozens. 
Tudors was responsible for cooking lavish banquets, setting an irresistible trend for the conservative upper class and the aspiring middle classes of Mexico to adopt a fashionable and sophisticated lifestyle. Fine restaurants opened in affluent cities in Mexico offering French menus during this short empire. And in the city of Mexico alone, 111 patisseries opened. The two most famous were owned by the French bakers Louis Renoir and the Plaisant Frères. To this day, Mexico has a big passion for pastries, and the Stepo Viennese croissant is one of the national favorites, smothered with butter and dunked in milky hot chocolate. The legacy of the Habsburg Empire, with their lavish wines, patisseries, bakeries, and French cooking techniques, transformed food in Mexico forever and influenced the creation of new dishes that combined the best of both gastronomies, one with an uncanny variety of ingredients and the other with refined methods that could only result in a delicious new cuisine filled with spiced brioches, piquant souffles, tropical tarts, and famously with la coche crepes. Part 7. Many Endings to close, 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 close this episode, I want to make a last reflection about why oh why and how Cinco de Mayo became the marketing frenzy for Tex-Mex food, beer, tequila and margarita bacchanals in the US. So let me warn you that the actual history of the Cinco de Mayo celebration in the US will totally surprise many of you because it's actually a truly inspiring and moving story of brotherhood, community building, solidarity and the quest to bring dignity and a sense of pride to Mexican-American people. Trust me, I can see you from behind the microphone that you are rising your eyebrows right there, but bear with me. I am of course not oblivious to the fact that Cinco de Mayo nowadays seems to bring two incredibly different countries and cultures in a very bizarre clash, brushing each other on the wrong side, where there only seems to be a commodification of Mexican symbols of identity and the vulgar commercialization of the celebration as an excuse to drink oneself to oblivion and dance to la cucaracha. Yes, I know that is all of that as well. But hear me out as I share with you a very sobering and utterly heartwarming book that casts light on this. So this book, written by David Hayes Bautista, who is a professor at the University of California, makes a fantastic point at telling us how the American interpretation of Cinco de Mayo as a festive celebration is actually a true American invention. And to explain this, he has to go back in history to remind us that thousands of Mexicans were, quote-unquote, given away along with the territories that Mexico gave to the U.S. at the end of the Mexican-American War. And no one ever stopped to think if they agreed or not and how would they identify themselves from that point onwards and which relationship will they have towards Mexico as their actual rightful homeland and their families. And after these events, the Mexican-American population still remained interested and concerned about the events during these tumultuous 1800s that I just spent the last hour or so telling you about. And often the news they received from Mexico were absolutely disheartening, confusing and worrying. The internal political fights had pushed the country into chaos. And on top of that, Napoleon was invading. And these poor people could do next to nothing but watch in horror as all these events unfolded. So when they received news about the victory of Zaragoza, the general of an army that represented freedom and democracy over the French forces, it was genuinely received with a spirit of relief and jubilation. After months and years of bad news, apprehension and impotence, this victory against injustice and abuse indeed meant a vindication by proxy. At that moment, they felt more Mexican than ever. There was every reason for them to celebrate Puebla's triumph. 
Now, let me insist on this fact that we're talking about a large community of former Mexicans who overnight became disenfranchised, pushed around, and were struggling to rebuild the social tissue, find their own voice. They longed to reconnect with their sense of belonging and feeling proud to be Mexican. After all, General Zaragoza was pretty much like them, because he had been born in what it was then Texas, which was still part of the extensive territory of Coahuila. But even after what happened with the territory, Zaragoza went to make his short but very impressive military career serving in the army in Mexico and ultimately fighting for this nation, for freedom and for democracy. In Zaragoza, Mexican Americans had the hero they needed. A little but charming and hugely significant anecdote is after the triumph of Zaragoza, the Mexican community of California raised money to pay for a sword that will be specially forged to honor Zaragoza after raising more than $50,000, a lot of money back then. So this beautiful sword was made and it featured many symbols like the Aztec eagle and a Californian gold nugget and the head of a grizzly bear. But by the time the sword was ready to be shipped, they received the sad news that Ignacio had passed away. So they decided to send it anyway to President Juarez. And the sword was proudly put on display next to other patriotic relics. Now, all these relics and many more objects went missing after the second French invasion during the years of the Habsburg Empire. But if you wanted to start your own treasure hunt adventure, this is your chance. Now, realizing that Juarez's presidency was in grave danger and he had no other resources to fight back, the Mexican community in California and other nearby states started raising money through the creation of a total of 129 Mexican patriotic committees. And every month, they sent money to Benito Juarez through these grassroots organizations that became key for the Latino and Mexican communities as it gave them leadership and hope. And one year after the death of Zaragoza, the first organized public celebration of his greatest victory took place in Los Angeles. And the occasion became also a way to celebrate freedom, the end of slavery in the US, defending democracy and all the values that President Lincoln was also ardently defending. Over the years, the celebrations of Cinco de Mayo in the US and particularly in California had been slowly been resignified to accommodate different meanings and to echo the values and needs of every generation. But by the time we get to the 20th century, in the mid-1980s and 1990s, the marketing industry saw this as an opportunity to fully embrace the commodification of Mexican-like symbols, foods and drinks to advertise all sorts of products and focus the attention on the fun and carnival-like aspect of it as a sort of Mardi Gras a la Mexicana. But there are still large American communities who take enormous pride in the preparation and the celebration of Cinco de Mayo because it strengthens their sense of community, pride in their heritage and identity. I often get asked by Americans if I think it is correct for them to celebrate Cinco de Mayo. Well, my answer always comes in the form of questions. I ask them, why do you celebrate it? Are you comfortable with the way Mexican culture is portrayed? Have you thought about celebrating it with actual Mexican-American people? Because ultimately, I really don't think I should be telling anyone what to do or what to think about it. But perhaps I can offer different ways to understand this phenomena. I think the best way to self-assess your choices is by asking yourself if what you do is good for you and good for others, if it's offensive to you or to others. Because it's got less to do with political correctness and more to do with how we view the world and how we interact with it. Okay, so after getting a bit existential and philosophical, I'm going to close this episode asking you where do you stand regarding Cinco de Mayo? Has this episode made you come to any realization or questioning? And if you're planning on celebrating Cinco de Mayo again next year, how will you do it this time? (music) 
Thank you for listening. This long but fun, I hope, episode was written and produced by me, Rocio Carvajal. If you want to know more about the references that I mentioned in this episode, including the book El Cinco de Mayo by David Hayes Bautista, check this episode's notes. I also made, as usual, a YouTube version if you want to see the faces and places that I mentioned today. While travel restrictions and lockdown are ongoing, I can't take you on one of my full tours in my city of Puebla. But you can take my ebooks with you, which are specially written to be an immersive adventure with stories, cultural curiosities around each of the traditional recipes that I have carefully researched and tested. My virtual shop is always open for you, and you only need doing some clicking around to start enjoying the many cooking adventures that I have for you. Please remember, you can always reach out to me on social media. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and you can drop me a line or an email to say hi. You can write me to hello at pasochipotle.com. I don't know if you've already explored another podcast I produce that is called Hungry Books, which is especially made for curious foodies like you. This is the intro of the show. And on the description of this episode, you can find the link to listen to it. You are listening to Hungry Books, a podcast about the best books ever written on the subject of food. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food history writer, cook and author. And each episode, I present a book that will change your life. Hungry books. Well, that's it for today, my friends. Until the next time.